Good morning, Lighthouse Baptist Church. It's good to be with you this morning. It's Sunday. It's time for our virtual get-together. So I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in, and I look forward to spending some time with you today. And We're going to open up the Word of God and, and uh, get into our study this morning in just a few moments. But let's go ahead and start things off this morning with a word of prayer. We certainly need prayer as a church, and I want to thank you uh, for the prayers that you've prayed this week and your ongoing prayers uh, coming into this new week. We're going to need some more, and so let's just continue to soak uh, the throne of grace with our prayers and our petitions, and let's do that uh, beginning our service right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for an opportunity uh, to come unto you, Father, uh, to bring our needs before you, and Lord, as a people, we are a needy people, and we want to recognize that uh, Lord, that we stand before you in great need. And Lord, I pray that you'd please just meet with us in great and a mighty and a special way. Uh, Lord, we need encouragement from you. Lord, we need comfort from you. And so, Lord, I pray that we'd, we'd find that together this morning as we come around your word and as we come before the throne of grace. But Father, there are those among us that have real, uh, real needs, folks that we're really concerned about. And Father, we have certainly shared those needs uh, through this week, and we'll continue to, to update the church of, of those specific needs. And Father, we won't bring those up uh, this morning in this, in this public forum on this YouTube channel. But Lord, you know exactly what they are. And I thank you, Father, for those that have spread out these needs before you uh, during the week, Father, and brought them to the throne. And Lord, I just believe with all of my heart that you, that you hear us, and Lord, that you're going to answer our prayers. And, and so, Lord, we just look forward to seeing what you're going to do as we continue to move forward with our hand in yours, trusting you. Lord, thank you again for this opportunity to, to come before you now. And Lord, we're praying that you'd please just anoint this, this time together, Lord, this virtual time. Encourage us in great and mighty ways, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you for praying with me this morning. It's time now for us to turn to our memory verse, and our memory verse is in, in Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 15. If you would please go ahead and grab your Bible and turn there to Mark chapter number 16 and verse number 15. We'll go over it a few times uh, together. A couple of times we'll say it with the help in front of us and then if you would on that third time let's just try to say it uh, from memory if you can mark 16 15 let's say it together ready begin and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature mark 16 15 all right let's say it again ready begin and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. And then one last time, and if you would please just try to say this out loud uh, without the help, if you can, please. Ready, begin. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. All right, I hope that you're doing well with that, and, and let's get that, that great commission verse into our heart and into our life. Well, God certainly wants us to take the light and be a bright witness for Him in this world. And certainly at a time like this, we need, we need to let our light so shine that folks may see our good deeds and glorify our Father which is in heaven. All right, it's time now for us to turn our attention to our message this morning. And uh, we're going to be taking that from the book of Ephesians. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible, grab a pen. And if you'd like the handout for the message this morning, it is in the description uh, box below the video. So if you'd like to go ahead and pause the video, uh, print that out, get it ready, get it in front of you. And uh, we'll get back together when you're ready. So go ahead and press the pause button now. And when you turn it back on, uh, we'll get right into the message. All right, welcome back. I hope you got everything you need and you're ready to go. Let's go ahead and take our Bibles now, open to the book of Ephesians. And our scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter number 3 this morning, Ephesians 3. And we're going to take a look at verse number 14. Ephesians 3, 14. I hope that you're ready. Take a look there with me, if you would, please. The Word of God says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just read that one more time together. For this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me as we get started this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for your scriptures today, Lord. I thank you for an opportunity 
uh, to come together around your word. And Father, as we've already mentioned in prayer this morning, we certainly need for you to meet with us. And Lord, we desire to meet with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd enter into our presence today, enter into our homes, enter into this time together around this, uh, this virtual uh, get-together, Lord. I pray that you'd please just uh, help us now to hear from you, to hear the truth, and to take that truth, Father, and apply it to our lives to make a difference in our lives, with our families, with our church, and in the world today. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesian church to instruct and encourage them in this new mystery of God's work in the world that we call the church, that the Bible calls the church. It's uh, new to the New Testament. It's not an Old Testament truth. Uh, God has revealed it to us through the apostles in the New Testament as they have laid the foundation uh, for this new thing called the church. And so in Ephesians 3, a little bit earlier in the chapter, we read, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So in verse 14, Paul is telling them that he has prayed for them. And then he gives them the reason why he bows his knee before the Lord on their behalf. So look again at verse number 14 where he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells them why he has prayed for them. In verse 16 he says that God would grant them to be strengthened in the inner man. In verse 17 that, that Christ may dwell in their heart by faith. In verses 17 through 19 he says that they may be able to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of the love of Christ. And then lastly there in verse 19 he says and that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And so Paul gives very powerful reasons why he has been praying for them. Great reasons that, that we should pray for even today. But I'd like uh, to take his statement here in verse number 14 and broaden it out just a little bit and take it beyond just uh, Paul's application to the Ephesians and kind of apply it to prayer in general, prayer in our own lives, and then ask this question, why should we pray? What is the cause of our prayers? Now, finding the answer uh, for why we pray, scripturally speaking, we find that that is actually a very big question, and the answer could take us in several directions. For instance, we've learned in the past, and we'll learn again in the future, that, that the very essence of prayer is seeking God. And it's important to understand that. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Any prayer that is not seeking God is not true prayer, because seeking God is the very essence of prayer. And we could kind of go in and develop that idea. But also, prayer is about building our relationship with God. And we could talk about how prayer is a relational thing with our Lord. It is the tool that He has given to us to communicate to Him. And so in the book of the Psalms, the Bible says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. God has told us to cry unto Him, if you will, to pray to Him, and that He will hear us. And so it's a relationship issue. But then also the Psalms teach us that prayer is a way for us to praise God and demonstrate our prayers, uh, praise to God and for us to love God and show our love to the Lord. And so the psalmist said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Prayer is also a tool for strengthening our faith and trust in God. And so the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And so the answer to our question, what is the cause of our prayers, could take us in a number of good and useful directions, uh, things that we should study even in our own time. But I would like to focus our attention on just one of the many reasons why we should pray. Now Paul asked an important question in Romans chapter number 8 when he said, If God be for us, who can be against us? 
That's an important question. And that is what we want in our walk with God. We want to know that that God is with us. We want God to be for us because if God is for us, then who can be against us? But Paul just had to go and make the, uh, the question itself conditional by saying, if God be for us, why does he do that? I mean, clearly that means that that as we live our Christian life, God might not be for us. Now there is a thought to think about. Why would God not be for us? Well, surely he's not going to be for us if we're living in known sin and rebellion against God. If you are, then I, then I beg of you this morning, take time and confess and forsake your sin, as the Bible says. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And so take time to go before the throne of grace and, and get that cleared up with God. But if you're not living in, in known sin and rebellion, then does God give us a clue as to why he might not be for us? And yes, indeed, he does. God tells us that he hates pride and the prideful man. And because he does, we are told that God resisteth the proud. Now think about what that's saying. Instead of being actively for us and working on our behalf, God is actively against us when we are proud. He resisteth the proud, actively standing against us. So we are given the responsibility to humble ourselves. And so in 1 Peter, the Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, with that in mind, turn, if, turn, if you would, please, with me to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter number 18. And we want to ask this question, what does it mean for us to humble ourselves and how do we do it? What does it mean for us to humble ourselves? If we're to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, what does it mean and how do we do it? Jesus answers that question this way in Matthew 18. Look there with me at verse number four, if you would, please. The Bible says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you're the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, surely that must mean that God is for you and God is working on your behalf. And so the idea here is that we are to humble ourselves as a little child. Now, to understand how to humble yourself as a little child, we need to think about the perspective of a child. A child understands his limitations. A child knows that, that he doesn't know all the things that mom and dad knows. A child understands that he cannot do what mom and dad does and that he cannot survive without mom and dad. In other words, a child knows that he needs his mom and his dad. He understands he has limitations. And a child is okay with having limitations. And he's okay with trusting mom and dad to help him and to go to mom and dad and to ask for help. It's kind of second nature for a child to go when he has a need and ask for the, for the need to be met. I'm hungry. Uh, I, I need something, whatever that might be. And so it's natural for a child to go to mom and dad and ask because of their limitations. So to humble yourself as a child is to understand that you too have limitations. And this is the reason why we pray. Prayer is a tool that enables us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And that's the idea of getting God on our side because he resisted the proud. If we want him actively on our side, we need to humble ourselves. And the tool that God has given us to do that is this tool of prayer that we might humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Through prayer, we acknowledge our limitations, just like a child acknowledges their limitations to their father. We humble ourselves as a little child, and we ask our Heavenly Father for His help. So let's talk this morning about our limitations. And let's begin, number one, with the idea that we have limited understanding. Limited understanding. Turn with me, if you would, please, to 2 Samuel chapter number 5. In your Old Testament, the book of 2 Samuel and chapter number 5. Now, as we 
we grow in this life, we, we gain experience over time and, and because of the things that we go through in this life. And experience is a great teacher, but experience is not an infallible teacher. And we need to understand that. We find this truth here in 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Look with me, if you would, please, at verse number 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And so David is new at this, this thing that we call being a king. He's not, he's not been king for very long. And he recognized that he has limited understanding. And so what David does is he, is he humbles himself through prayer. And as a little child, he asked his father for help in this circumstance where now the enemies of God are coming against the people of God. And David, again, in his newness as king, just recognizes his limited understanding and he goes to God. Look at verse number 19. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And so he follows God's direction, and God does indeed help him. And so we read in verse number 20, And God uh, and David came to baal Perazim. David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore called he the name of that place baal Perazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. So here we have a great example of what we're talking about, the idea that we have limited understanding. And, and David recognized that he just didn't have a whole lot of understanding, a lot of experience as a king just yet. And so he goes to God, he does the right thing, and he asks for help. But then something interesting happens. The Philistines, they came again. Look, if you would, please, at verse number 22. The Bible says, And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, it seems like we've just read that. Well, look back at verse number 18. The Bible says the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So essentially, they do the exact same thing that they've done before. They come against Judah, against David, and against Israel, and they spread themselves in the valley, the same valley, just like they had done before. So, hey, you can imagine David... David has seen this before. He's bought this ticket. Same song, second verse. He knows how to sing the song now. He's got the tune, if you will. And so David has gained some experience from the last time that they had spread themselves out in the valley. So all he has to do is do what he did before, and all will be right as rain. Easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy. Amen. And so it just seems like that's the natural way that this would be approached, except that if David had leaned on his own understanding and built on his experience the way that we often do, he would have failed. And so thankfully, he recognized that, that even with experience, he still had a limited understanding. Experience is a great teacher, but it is not an infallible teacher. And so David instead humbled himself through prayer once again, and as a little child, he asked his father for help a second time. Look at verse number 23. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up. Oh, my soul. Pretty good thing that David actually came and asked again. So God said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them. Go a different way this time and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Well, praise God, David didn't just rest on his experience. He took the time to again humble himself and go back to God and find out what God had to say about this new circumstance of the Philistines coming back again. And so because he did, he won the victory. Look at verse number 25. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. And so he won. Not only did he avoid defeat by doing the right thing and going to God and humbling himself, 
He won the victory. Life and experience, again, are not bad things in and of themselves. Again, experience is a great teacher. And we are certainly expected to grow in knowledge and in understanding. The Bible says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Grow in grace. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer. Study to show thyself approved. God does not put a priority on ignorance. God wants us to grow. God wants us to learn. And yet knowledge can be a dangerous thing as well. And so we need to understand that and rightly hold the knowledge and the experience that we gain. Because the Bible also says, knowledge puffeth up. Well, that's a scary thing. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we must be careful because knowledge can puff us up. In other words, knowledge can make us proud. It doesn't have to, but it can. And as we have seen, God actively works against the proud. God resisteth the proud. Experience encourages us to grow away from God because it causes us to believe that we've got it all figured out. Let David be our example here in this in this matter. I imagine that either way that David would have gone, he would have been humbled when the Philistines returned. You see, either he was going to humble himself in prayer in the way that he did before the battle, or he would have been humbled by the Philistines in the battle. And no one wants to be humbled in the battle. So David refused to allow his experience and knowledge to puff him up. He recognized that even with his newfound experience as king, his understanding still was limited. And we should learn, and we should grow, and we should try to understand things. But always remember that our understanding will always be limited. We should always uh, understand our need to humble ourselves in prayer and ask our Father for help again, as David has been an example for us in this story uh, this morning. So consider with me a second limitation as well. We also have a limited ability. Not only do we have a limited understanding, but we also have a limited ability. Turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Kings chapter 3. Uh, you're in 2 Samuel. The next book over is 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter number 3. Solomon has been now anointed as the king over all of Israel. David is now gone and Solomon is there on the throne, but he does not feel at this point in, in, in his journey on the throne. He doesn't feel as though he's able to fill his role. He's, he's a new king just like David was that we read just a moment ago. And so here in verse number seven, we find that he recognized his limited ability. I'll look at uh, verse number seven of chapter three. The Bible says, and now, O Lord, my God, Thou hast made thy servant, speaking of himself, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And so he did, he's not arrogant about this thing. He understands that, that, that his ability in all of this is limited. He's like a little child. And so he humbles himself through prayer. And as a little child, he comes to his father and he asks him for help. Look at verse number eight. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And so he comes again as a little child, humbling himself before the Lord and asks his father for help. Jesus said in John 15, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Without God, we have no ability at all. We can do nothing. Nobody can except that God gives the ability. And yet we're pretty pleased with our abilities. And we are quick to let everyone know that, that we did something when we're the ones that did something. And so we're pretty pleased with, with how we do things. 
but we did not give ourselves life, and we surely did not give ourselves any ability that we have. And so the Bible asks, why do we boast in our abilities? What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? That's a great question. Why is it that we are so enamored with ourselves and our abilities? Yet like Solomon, we have all been given roles to fill, things that God wants us to do. Now, we're not a king like Solomon was, but God has given us a variety of roles, from the, the, the role of being a Christian in the world and carrying the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, the role of father or mother, or maybe worker or teacher or leader in some capacity. And we are certainly all stewards of all that God has placed into our hands to be a steward of. And so we would do well to recognize that we have a limited ability to fill our roles. It'd be good if we recognize like Solomon did, that we don't have an ability without God. We need the Lord's help. In, in fact, as Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. And it'd be good for us to recognize that inability on our part without our Savior. It would be better for us to humble ourselves through prayer and come as a little child to our Father and ask Him for help. And I want you to notice that God did indeed help Solomon with his role as king. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says in the speech, pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked for the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And so God does indeed help Solomon. He answers his prayer. Now, without God, Solomon could do nothing. But with God, he was able to do all things. And in like manner, without Christ, we can do nothing. We have a limited ability. And, but when we humble ourselves through prayer and come as a little child to our Father and ask for help, then we are able to say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Without Christ, I can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Consider with me now one last limitation. We have, thirdly this morning, limited resources. Limited resources. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Second Chronicles. Uh, you're in First Kings, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Right after that, Second Chronicles, in chapter number fourteen. Now, as you're turning there, Jesus. Uh, spoke a parable at one point and he said this he said for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he hath sufficient to finish it or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand now before we look at second chronicles think with me real quickly about this idea of counting cost in the city that we lived in, in, in uh, California, they had begun the work uh, on, on a shopping mall. But partway through it, the investors ran out of money and the building just stopped. And for years, it sat right there on prime real estate, right by the freeway, looking like a ghost town. It was an eyesore and it was an embarrassment for the city. Now, it is a wise thing to take the time to count the cost before you get started in a thing because we have limited resources and there might not be enough to finish the job. Just like that job there in California that never did get finished. They finally got it all torn down and it, it became less of an eyesore over time, but it sure did take many years. Now here in, in uh, St. Chronicles, we find the, the, uh, the story of King Asa. And King Asa faced an army from Ethiopia. It was a huge army, a million-man army. Look, if you would, please, with me at verse number 9. The Bible says, And there came out against them Zira, the Ethiopian, with an host of a thousand thousand, a million-man army. 
and 300 chariots. And, uh, and they came uh, unto Maresha. And so th- here's a great, great army coming against the nation of Judah, against the king uh, Asa. Now Asa had no hope uh, with the resources that he had. He had no hope of being successful against such a huge army. And so Asa realized that he had limited resources. And so what he did was he humbled himself through prayer. And as a little child, he came to his father and he asked his father for help. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So once again, Asa had no hope with with the, the limited resources that he had. But God has riches and resources at his disposal that we do not have. And God is able to take a little and make much out of it. And that is what he did for Asa. Look at verse number 12, if you would, please. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar. And the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. So God did indeed supply their need. Asa had limited resources, but with the unlimited resources of heaven, God was able to take a little and make much out of it. When we too recognize that we have limited resources and we humble ourselves through prayer, and as as little children we come to our Father and ask for help, then we will find that God can supply our need. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all your need. Now, of course, the Bible does see, uh, say that God will supply our need, not our wants. But so long as we know and we understand that, that we're seeking first the kingdom of God and not our own kingdom, uh, that we're on God's side and God is in it, when God is in it, God will supply for it. And God can take our limited resources and make something great out of them. We just need to humble ourselves, go to the Lord, and ask our Father to take our hand and help us. So Paul wrote to the Ephesians saying, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we too have many causes, many reasons why we should bow our knees unto the Father. There are many good reasons for us to pray. And one of those reasons is that through prayer, we are able to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And as we've seen, humility really is a virtue because God actively works against the proud. God works on behalf of the humble. And if God be for us, praise God, who can be against us? So through prayer, we acknowledge our limitations. We humble ourselves as little children And we come and we hold out our hand to our Father and we ask our Father for help. So will you, through prayer, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God? Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we close our time together in prayer, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to learn and grow. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open your word and to learn from you. And I pray that that your Holy Spirit would move and work in the lives of each and every person who's taken the time to get to this point, Father, to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Father, through this this tool that you've given us of prayer to learn how to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, to understand, Lord, that, that we have limitations, that we are limited in our understanding and limited in our ability and limited in our resources. But Lord, we come to the God of all creation, to Almighty God. And Lord, we ask you, Father, to move and work on our behalf, to take those limitations that we have and to fill them with your spirit, with your power. And move and work, Father, as only you can. 
Lord, in our church today, Lord, we have real needs. And Father, as we humble ourselves before you in this prayer and we come before you this morning, Father, I pray that you'd enter into this prayer. I pray that you'd enter into the lives of those that are hurting. And I pray, Father, that you'd move and work as only you can. Lord, we do believe with all of our heart that little is much when, when God is in it. And so we're asking you, Father, to move and work and to make a difference for time and for eternity. And I pray, Lord, that as a church, we would enter into this prayer together and lift it up to you, Father. Pray that you would take it, fill it with your spirit and your power. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.